your first lesson learned is if you build it, they actually will come. Yeah. Yeah. I think that in developer tools, uh, especially like API first developer tools, if you build it, people will at least tinker with it um, and use it. And early Clearbit, the very first year, one thing that we did was um, we would launch a new product, and I'll put product in quotes here, every single month. So we had our core API, which was started as the person API, so data about people. You put in an email address, we'll give you back their role and seniority and what company they work for. Um, then we launched the company API, which was really just the end of that payload, which was where that company was located, what their legal name was, how many employees they had, et cetera. Then we launched the uh, logo API, which was just one attribute of that company API payload as its own small API. And we did an autocomplete API, a watch list API, a risk API, um, Clearbit Connect, which was a Gmail extension, Clearbit for Salesforce, which was a Salesforce extension, a free edition of that Salesforce extension, um, and on and on. And I think in that first year, we launched 11 or 12 products. We launched them on Hacker News, on uh, Product Hunt, on any sort of list aggregator where uh, developers were hanging out. And we got over that year 60-ish thousand people to come and create a Clearbit account. Um, did we get a ton of customers out of those exact marketing activities? I have no idea. We weren't set up to track it very well then. We didn't really like the way we were measuring the impact on revenue was incredibly basic. Um, but it helped us build up like a awareness and a pretty large audience really, really quickly. So launching something almost every single month became your marketing. It, it was pretty much the only marketing activity we did. We launched things and we told people about it and that was it. Uh, do you think this strategy would also work today? I think for an early stage company, yes. I think the strategy works today. I think if you're a more sophisticated uh, later stage company, it's probably not enough. Um, like the, unless you're able to consistently increase the places where you're, where you're communicating that launch, it's probably not enough. But I would say if you're an early stage company, especially if you have an API product or API first, then this, uh, I think is a great technique or a great strategy. So Hacker News is still, you know, up and going. Uh, I do feel Product Hunt has been, um, it's not like it was some years ago. There's uh, so much crap happening. And uh, I've been number one on Product Hunt maybe three times. And it mostly attracts tire kickers that, with, with no money. Uh, do you think there are any other channels that are good for launching today? That's a really good question. Um, I think... Every company is different. I think there's some subreddits that are like relatively low traffic, but very high intent. Um, for developer tools and developer products, there's lots of developer specific news aggregators. Um, yeah, I think it would depend on what you're building and, and what uh, your audience is. Your next lesson learned of uh, building Clearbit was trust the hackers. <laughs> yeah, um, this, was something that we experienced a lot of early on at Clearbit, but people basically hacking Clearbit. And what I mean by that is like finding ways to get way more out of the product than they're paying for. Um, using the API, uh, finding ways that they could use like the partial API and not hit quota limits, like all sorts of things. But my favorite example of this is this guy, Guillaume Cabane, who is relatively, uh, relatively well known in the growth uh, hacker world. And he was at um, either segment or drift. I can't remember exactly which. Um, and we found out that he'd been using our person API, um, but not returning email addresses. So basically like there was a way that you could use the API that we didn't count as an API request. Um, and he was doing it to the tune of, you know, 500, 600,000 extra calls every single month. Um, and at first we we're like, holy shit, like we have to go shut this down and charge this guy more. But instead we just like, reached out to him, met up with him, learned what he was doing. And what he was doing was like a very, very cool way of combining these data sets, um, only like using all of these calls to get like the biggest possible basket of people. And then uh, like filtering down to the ones that were most valuable for him and then creating records with them. Um, and it was like a really cool automated outbound story that now is actually a clear product called clear capture. So I think like my lesson learned there was don't shut down the hacker. When you find that person that's abusing your product, find out how and why 
And I think, I don't know the, the uh, stat here, but some percentage of the time, that's going to be a huge like product unlock for you. Um, and it was, was for us. And with Guillaume, I think that happened like two or three times. Yeah, people using your product in unexpected or unconventional ways, I think, has been the story of a lot of um, you know, successful companies. eBay comes to mind as, uh, as one of them. And I've certainly seen this also with, uh, with Winter. And my, I, I feel like first reaction is always like, no, 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 that's not how you're supposed to use that. You're right. expensive. Then it's like, well, why are you doing that? Oh, yeah, like actually our product doesn't enable you to do this straight, so you need to like, your way around it yeah or you're doing something completely different like your your job to be done is not the job to be done we built the product for but like that might be a, an opportunity for a, you know a new product surface area yeah now i will say there are many with clearbit and many like data products um, or even just uh, infrastructure api products there are going to be the abusers who are just trying to get more of the thing right and, yeah. uh, and that, that's an opportunity to charge them more money that's right. Uh, your lesson learned number three is an interesting one. Customer success cannot be delegated. Yeah, so I could absolutely be wrong here. But the thing that we learned um, in about four different customer success leaders at Clearbit over probably five years or maybe a little bit less than that um, was we couldn't delegate customer success successfully at Clearbit. <clears throat> And what changed and when we were able to really get our hands around clear or customer success at least a bit better was putting founder energy and effort into it. Um, and now I don't think that's going to be everyone's situation, but I think taking your eye off of customer happiness, customer success, even support is like a really bad idea early on. And I think it's compounded if you are a developer tool API first, like infrastructure type product where the usage of your product doesn't directly correlate with the success of the customer. So I'll give you a, an example here with Clearbit. Um, it was a data API. You, you know, like you're getting, you're sending API requests through to enrich your Salesforce, your CRM, your market automation, whatever it might be. <clears throat> and we would have customers that would have 80, 90% usage every single month, look super, super green because they're, they're hitting the API. And then you go talk to them and something is messed up in their integration or the way that they're mapping those fields to somewhere else. And like, they haven't seen the data in five or six months. They're super unhappy. Um, and I think like the, an API product just can really obfuscate uh, the value customers are actually getting because usage does not equal value. Um, and that's something that was very hard for us to identify at Clearbit and has taken the combination of a lot of exec attention, founder attention, and also product attention to get us closer and closer to the place where we understand how successful a customer is based on their usage of the product. So when you say it cannot be delegated, you know, uh, what, what stage of the company are we talking about? This is like first million in revenue, first 10 million. Yeah, I wish I had a clean answer to that. Um, we tried to delegate it between, you know, one, probably around 1 million is when we brought our first customer success person in. Um, we probably tried to delegate, delegate it four times between 1 million in ARR and 25 million in ARR and uh, continued to not be as successful as we wanted to be. Um, I think one other piece there is we had picked a market where we really liked the innovators in that market, the top one, two, three percent of our customers were super interesting, doing crazy fun stuff with the product. The rest of the market was doing very straightforward data enrichment, like plug it into Salesforce, enrich my account contact records. And we were a little bit lazy and didn't have as much fun on conversations with those customers. So we didn't have them, um, which I think uh, is an, a second learning here is customer success is hard and shouldn't be delegated early. and make sure you pick a, pick a market where you love your customers. And if you haven't, you better learn how to love those customers and love spending time with those customers. I'd like to still uh, learn a little more about, so those people, customer success people that did not work out. Yeah. What did they do wrong or what did they not do that only a founder can do or could do? Yeah, I'm sure it's not only a founder can do. 
But I think the thing that founders are uniquely, typically uniquely good at is they have all of the context. They understand so much more of the context of the product, the context of what other earlier customers have done, what all the evolutions between what a customer looked like on month three versus year three. And the thing that we identified when we put founder attention in was really that usage didn't equal value like that. Uh, it took us a long time to get there, but when we really dug in and started spending time with um, more and more of these customers, we found out that usage didn't equal value, that the top few percent of customers that we had been spending a lot of time with, the rest of the customers didn't look like them, didn't think about value the same way, weren't looking at the same success metrics, didn't know how to define success metrics. And I think we just like got way dirtier, way quicker. Um, and looking back on that, I haven't haven't spoken about this before, so this might not be the cleanest, but one thing that's hard is when you hire a CS leader, you give them metric goals that they're, you know, gold against, and asking them to tell you that those goals are wrong uh, and they should be doing something else probably is, is is hard, right? So when we we would set the goal of you should think about success through usage, right? Like a, we want to get every customer to 70% of their plan usage. That's how we, that's how we're going to know that they're successful. Um, but that actually wasn't the metric that mattered. Right. Mm. So it's being a person who challenges that, Hey, this is not what we should be measuring or it's, uh, only telling a part of the story. Right. Um, yeah. Right. And someone that's willing to like dig in there and figure out, uh, go to ask ask those five why questions and keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing. And I'm sure there's customer success leaders out there that can do that, um, but uh, we didn't do that early on, um, and we took our eye off of like the we took our eye off the majority of our customer success and just spent our time on on like what we thought of as the top few percent. Uh, your lesson number four is about pricing, that it should be based on complexity, not usage. Yeah. So um, let me paint a, a picture here. We're like year one at Clearbit, where our pricing page is very simple. It has four columns in it, like many pricing pages do. Uh, basic, you know, beginner, medium, advanced packages, enterprise package, contact for enterprise pricing. Each one lists our, at the time, four APIs, person, company, watch list, risk, and then how many API calls you get. So for a person, you get 50,000, uh, for a company, you get 50,000, et cetera. Um, and that pricing was between the end of year one and the end of year four, we close to 50X our per call pricing and completely split out all of these different APIs that had been packaged together. Uh, I'll tell you why, because Pure usage does not equal value. And what we found is the complexity of usage uh, indicated the value a customer is getting way more than the volume of usage. Um, and again, this is like semi-specific for API products, but I don't think, not completely, but really it's like the, there are some very small companies that are gonna use a ton of your product and not necessarily get that much value or have the ability to pay for that usage. Uh, or pay for more. There are very large companies that are gonna use a tiny, tiny amount of usage or, or of uh, API calls, but get a ton of value because they're using it in a really complex and important way. Um, really interesting example of this, Dropbox was an early Clearbit customer. Um, they used us for one attribute, the company type attribute. And really all they were trying to determine is, is this current sign up a personal business or a corporate, is it a personal website or, or some sort of company entity? Um, and for them, that was, they were, you know, only using that one data attribute. They weren't touching any of the other data. Their usage wasn't that high. That was incredibly valued because it drove a bunch of complex uh, business decisioning for them. And for many of our other customers, that was like useless data, right? So charging them the same that we were going to charge someone else for that attribute made no sense. So really it's it's about value-based pricing how much value the end customer is getting totally and it's about value-based pricing but i think the better corollary to value-based pricing is complexity versus usage 
Um, Because I think you need some sort of, especially if you have a self-serve motion, you're not going to be able to price each customer individually. And you need some sort of uh, way of like guessing at how much value someone is getting. Uh, Complexity is the best way to do that. So how many different places are they using the data? Um, Are they combining different parts of the product? Um, And I think it's a, it's, it's challenging to do, but for API products, there's a couple ways of doing it that are uh, uh, kind of shortcuts. So in this um, Dropbox's case, it sounds like the actual application, the, the way they were using it was simple. Just the value, well, uh, how would you figure so, out that you should charge them more in this case? Yeah, so it really wasn't all that simple because they were using it uh, directly via API. They were using it in Salesforce. They were using it in Marketo. Um, they were using it in, in their analytics products because they use that same funnel, that same like personal or business in so many different places. It was so important to the business that they used it everywhere. And so being able to charge them based on, okay, you're going to use that on your website. You're going to use that in CRM. You're going to use that market automation and thinking of those as different, uh, as more complex ways of using the data. And so would you, would you then uh, figure this out in a sales conversations when like figuring out how much somebody should pay? Uh, I, I imagine that's easier way rather than on your website. It's like, oh, if you have this usage pattern, that's the totally, price. totally. I think, uh, yes, there are occasionally, there are ways you can charge based on like number of integrations. I think Snowflake does this particularly well where they have a bunch of different levers on how many places you're going to send the data. Um, they charge, Snowflake does a really nice job of this. They charge based on how much you're writing out, how much you're putting in, and how many different places you're sending the data. Your final lesson learned is about outbound sales. To start yeah. outbound earlier than you should. Yeah, earlier than you think you should. Um, I think... What, I, what we felt at Clearbit and what I see still at a lot of the companies that I'm investing in today is everyone wants to be bottoms up PLG um, and outbound is not a dirty word, but it's not something that most founders want to talk about early on or want to do. And I'll give you, I'll give you two examples. I'll give you the Clearbit example and then another company that I'm pretty close with. Um, in Clearbit, we started outbound on year four and a year and a half later, outbound was still less than 5% of um, pipeline, um, which is not, not a success. I think it's indicative of, well, and actually, actually, we should be clear, we want out today, today outbound I think is about 20%. We would love it to be 40, 50%, because outbound is a very scalable, predictable motion, especially as the company gets bigger. Um, I'll give a counter example of a company in the HR space that's pretty well known. They started outbound from day one. They decided they were going to do outbound in some ways before they even built a product. They built their MVP and then they started just ripping outbound with six SDRs, two marketing ops, data people, and the founder CEO writing the outbound email copy. And they did that for a year and a half. It was their only marketing activity. They didn't have a marketing team. They were just sending outbound email. And uh, learning what message resonated, learning uh, what product features and what product ideas re- uh, uh, resonated. Um, and because outbound, like getting someone to respond to an outbound email is probably the, the hardest first hurdle that you can think of. Uh, you really, really are forced to focus on the pains that, that get people to respond. Um, and for this company, they were able to get outbound working where they were able to drive real consistent pipeline uh, and not only know what message was resonating, but also what product features people were most excited about in an outbound context. They used that to build their website. They used that to build all their marketing materials as they brought in a marketing team. They used that to play on the product roadmap. Um, And they were able to go from 10 to 100 million, I think in about 18 months on year three, um, because they really, really nailed this in the first first 18 months. So... The prerequisite here is that there needs to be a severe pain that the prospect is feeling. Sure. I mean, we, yeah, if we go back to the basics, it's like you really need to identify that pain. I think outbound is a particularly uh, effective way of, of, of identifying pain early. 
Um, I think with bottoms up or freemium, you can end up with something that's a vitamin that people are tire kicking or trying or using. Um, but if outbound is the way you get people to respond, then it's more likely to be a real pain. And what did outbound uh, program look like at Clearbet? Was it a, a mainly cold email, sequences, also cold calling? What went in there? Yeah, uh, emails, calls, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, kind of the whole the whole gamut. Uh, I would say it's a relatively standard outbound playbook for um, like the modern SaaS company. I think the unique things that Clearbit has is access to some cool um, intent data assets that were very useful. Um, our most effective outbound loop today is identifying companies that are visiting the website that are not already accounts in Salesforce. Uh, or, or their cold accounts not assigned to someone, um, and then creating those as new pipeline. Uh, to your portfolio companies, uh, w w w when you advise them, do you tell them to start outbound on day one? Or, um, when's, the, when's the best time? It really depends. I think there, are, um, as always, it depends on what the team strengths are. Like if if the team is not going to be successful at outbound, like that, that shouldn't start there. Start with things that you're good at, um, or if you have specific leverage somewhere else. But I do, I do recommend people think about outbound way earlier than they typically do. Think about a year one, year two, maybe start your your tests, your trials for more enterprisey companies. I really think outbound from day one is really smart. Um, yeah. And a lot, a lot of leaders, sales leaders say that, you know, if your ACV is below 15K, just the numbers don't work. Is, is your experience similar? No, um, I think uh, Ramp is a pretty good example here. Um, Ramp's ACV was, I think, like, you know, five or 6K in the beginning for their SMB customers. They went very hard into outbound for SMBs their first two years um, and then expanded with those companies over time. Uh, if you have a land and expand motion um, and you think that 15 can turn into uh, 50 or 100, then absolutely it's worth it. If it's below 15 and it will stay below 15, th then you're going to need automated outbound um, versus like SDR led outbound. But I, I still think the plays can work. 